Hello and welcome to our online class. This is Statistics 1 and uh, we are starting a new chapter today, a chapter on uh, concepts of probabilities. So over the last several weeks during this semester we've talked about descriptive statistics. All of the chapters we've discussed so far are all within this part of statistics. And as the name suggests, Within these several chapters, what we've done is basically we've learned a little bit on uh, collecting data and summarizing data, or in other words, just describing the data so we can clearly see what's uh, generally going on within the data without too much conclusions that we draw from the data itself. Now we start to move on gradually into inferential statistics. So we'll try to make some inferences. So as the name suggests, we'll try to make some conclusions about the data, not simply describe what's happening in the data, but we'll try to say, hmm, given that this is the data we have, perhaps it means that uh, such and such and such things are going to happen. So we're going to make some conclusions about the population that we might study based on a sample. And often, even though we are trying to study something about the population, we cannot have access to the whole population. That is why we have to analyze the data on the sample only. And that creates an incomplete information for us as a decision maker, for us as those who make some inferences from the data. For example, let's say you have thousands of tons of wires, and uh, as a manager of the company, you want to test how strong are those wires? Well, you can't test the whole population of thousands of wires because if you test how strong they are, in the process of testing, you, you will break those wires and you can't break all of them. You have to sell something. So you're only going to test a small part of those wires. You're only going to collect the data on the sample, but you're actually studying something about the population, about all of the wires that are available in your company. Alternatively, another example, if you want to study something about uh, student opinion on some policy in Taiwan, let's say, you again might not be able to ask the opinion of all the thousands and thousands and thousands of students that are studying in Taiwan. Perhaps instead you will have a survey of, I don't know, say 1,000, 2,000, perhaps even 3,000 students and make some conclusions based on that data regarding the sample rather than the population of all of the students in Taiwan. So this tells you that often statisticians have to work with incomplete information. And when we have incomplete information, we often have uncertainty because you can't be extremely certain, extremely sure on how the features of the sample translate into the features of the population that you are trying to study. So because of this uncertainty, there is a chance that your conclusion is correct, there is a chance that your conclusion is incorrect, there is a chance that a given feature of the population will be the same as that within the sample or not. So there is a chance that is kind of becomes important and a theory that discusses the chance, discusses chances is probability theory. Hence, in this topic we are going to talk about probabilities. I think you guys know what is a probability, but just to review, just to make sure everyone is on the same page, probability is just a description of chances that something will happen or will not happen. Probability is between 0 and 1. So if there is a probability of 0 for some kind of event, then it's uh, pretty certain that the event will not happen. If the probability of an event is equal to 1, then it's uh, pretty certain that this event will happen. But often, of course, as we discussed, we have some uncertainty. So often probability is somewhere between 0 and 1. Let's say, for example, probability is equal to 0 0.5. That means there is a 50% chance that an event will happen. Let's say an event being a flip of a coin ending up in a head. A probability of such is 0.5 or 50 percent. So as you see from this example, probabilities can be described either in decimals as in 0.5 or in uh, percentages as in let's say 50 percent. Probabilities can also be expressed in a fraction as in uh, one half 
Or for another example, let's say there is another event, not a flip of a coin. And let's say the chance of this event actually happening is around 73%. So probability can be expressed either in decimals 073 or in percentages 73% or in fractions 73 one hundredths. So probabilities can be expressed either as decimals, percentages, or fractions. And there's another way to express probabilities, which are odds. So that's odds. When probabilities are expressed as odds, you will hear something like, well, the odds of uh, this event happening is, let's say, 2 to 5. So that means if you have seven opportunities for the event to take place, Generally, in two of these seven times, the event will take place, and in the other five times, the event will not take place. So the probability over here, if you want to express this as percentage, is not 40%. It's not 2 out of 5. That's actually 2 out of the total number of trials, 2 out of 7. So whatever are the actual numbers, when probability is expressed in odds, the probability, if you want to calculate that in percentages, is going to be that x divided by x plus y. In this case, if the odds are 2 to 5, the probability is actually 2 out of 7. In another example, if the odds are, let's say, 5 to 10, the probability of an event happening is actually 5 over 15. Next, let's uh, have a chat about several uh, concepts in probabilities. Before we go into uh, more interesting calculation stuff, uh, this part is perhaps a little bit more descriptive. So first of all, let's start with some definitions, and uh, we're going to start with experiment. Experiment is basically a process that leads to one of the several possibilities, one of the several results actually taking place. An example over here would be uh, an example of experiment is, let's say, throwing two Two dice. Next, we're going to have a look at uh, outcome. Outcome is a particular result of an experiment. For example, when you are throwing two dice, what are the possible outcomes? Well, uh, there are quite a few of them. You can get either double one or one two or two three. Actually, let me convert to a simpler example. If the experiment is throwing only one die, one piece of die, the result can be a number coming up as only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. So uh, to explain the same thing with an illustration, with a picture, so it's a little bit easier to understand, throwing one of these kind of dice, as you see on the pictures, is an experiment, and the outcome of such experiment could be a number, as I said, from 1 to 6. One particular number that comes from 1 to 6. And we could also have an event over here. An event would be a collection of results. An event could be a collection of results. Uh, for example, if you have to throw these dice, if you have to throw one of these dice, let's say three times, three times, an outcome of each of those throws is a number from one to six. But the actual event is a collection of those three numbers. First was number two, let's say, second was number six, and third was number three. So sometimes uh, an experiment is only run one time, like if you have to throw one of these dice only one time. And sometimes, of course, experiment includes uh, several throws of these kind of dice. So sometimes um, it's a bit confusing when people use event and outcome interchangeably. But basically, as a result of an experiment, we get an outcome and uh, sometimes a collection of those outcomes is an event, but if the experiment is only run one time, uh, then just one outcome is that event that you'd be looking at. Next, we can actually have several understandings of probabilities. First is classical probability. Classical probability is your general intuitive understanding of probabilities. And it assumes that all outcomes in an experiment are equally likely. For example, our general understanding of how these dice work is that when you throw one of them, uh, you perhaps think that uh, the number one is as likely to come up as number two or as number four. 
And this understanding, this assumption that all outcomes are equally likely in an experiment also helps us with calculation of classical probabilities. So, for example, if you want to calculate how much is the probability that an even number appears when you throw one of those dice over here, uh, then uh, you would understand that, well, there are three favorable outcomes. You could get number two, four, or six, which all agree with uh, this question over here, an even number appearing. And there are three unfavorable numbers. Uh, you could get a number one, three, or five, in which case the event that you're looking at would not actually take place. And the probability, if you assume all of these outcomes are equally likely, are equally likely. Then the probability is, of course, three favorable ones over the total number of outcomes, six, which is 50%. Next, as we continue with our definitions, is uh, mutually exclusive. A mutually exclusive means that uh, the events cannot take place at the same time. If one of the events actually occurs, it means that the other event cannot really occur at the same time. Uh, for example, if a boss is selecting whom to give the task to among the employees and selects one of the persons, an example of a mutually exclusive result, mutually exclusive outcome, is the gender of that employee that was selected. It's either male or female. Uh, for another example, if you are traveling from Taipei to Kaohsiung and you are choosing one mode of transportation, and you only choose between a car and a train, this is also an example of mutually exclusive choice, a couple of events that are actually mutually exclusive. You can either travel by car or by train, but you can't travel by car and by train and at the same time. You can't split yourself between these two modes of transportation. Next, we're talking about collectively exhaustive. Collectively exhaustive uh, means that a list of outcomes, a list of uh, possible results of an event actually includes all of the possibilities. No possibilities have actually been forgotten to be included in the list. So what it also means is that at least one of the events listed in the collectively exhaustive list must actually take place as a result of an experiment. Uh, let's have a look at a couple of examples. Here is an um, incorrect list of what might actually happen if you throw one of those dice. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list of possible events. This is not an exhaustive list of possible outcomes. You could have number one coming up, or two, or three, or five, or six. Uh, we've actually forgotten about number four over here. And uh, this is a, a, an exhaustive list of possible events, an exhaustive list of possible outcomes. One of these six numbers must actually take place. Over here in uh, the non-exhaustive list, because we've missed something, it's not necessarily the case that one of these will actually come up for sure. Uh, whereas over here, since we've included all possibilities, even if number four comes up, it's still within the list. Whereas in the previous example, if number four comes up, it's not actually within the list that we're looking at. Uh, what it also means is that the total sum of probabilities for an exhaustive list is equal to one. Because if you assume that each of these numbers, if you're looking at uh, a number shown on the die that you are throwing, if each of these numbers are equally likely to appear, the probability for each of these is 1 6. So probability of each of these would be 1 6. Copy this and uh, continue copying again. So if you sum up all of these numbers, of course 1 6 summed up 6 times is equal to 1, 100% or 1. Whereas uh, over here the total sum of all probabilities, which is again 1 6 for each of these numbers, the sum of those is only 5 6, so it's less than 1. And again, to try again without Excel actually breaking my formula, let's change that to 5, 6 as the total sum of probabilities. So lastly, about classical probabilities, and perhaps uh, most importantly, because you want to take note of any formulas I tell you, as you noted from our couple of calculations above, classical probability 
is equal to number of favorable outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes. Again, to repeat the previous example, if you are looking for probability of even number taking place as a result of throwing one of those dice, uh, your classical probability is equal to 0.5, number of favorable outcomes is 3, total number of outcomes is 6. Next, let's move on to the empirical probability. Classical probability, as we mentioned, is generally based on our intuitive understanding of what's uh, likely to happen. Empirical probability is more based on uh, actual measurements, actual history telling us what had actually happened. So empirical probability is equal to the fraction of times, is equal to the percentage of times that a given event actually took place in the past. And uh, again, to talk about the formulas, empirical probability is the number of times event actually occurred uh, divided by the total number of observations. Uh, so, for example, if you are throwing uh, a coin, this is not a perfect example for empirical probability because you also have some intuitive understanding of what's going to happen with a coin toss uh, when you throw a coin. Uh, basically, you intuitively understand that the probability of giving, getting a head as a result of throwing a coin is perhaps around 50%. Uh, but if you are strictly talking about empirical probability, if you throw a coin only one time, the actual outcome is either head doesn't come up or it does. So the actual empirical probability of throwing one coin only one time and looking at the probability of heads coming up, the actual result, the actual empirical probability here is either zero or one. But of course, as you throw the coin many, 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 many times, the actual empirical historical probability of the head coming up it gets closer and closer and closer and closer to 50%. gets closer to half of the time. And so that brings us to the law, to the law of large numbers. As the number of events, as the number of experiments increases to a large number of events, as for example over here, many, many, many throws of a coin, many, many, many tosses of a coin, and then the, then the result for the empirical probability approaches comes closer to the actual true probability of that event taking place. So while with this example, when we throw a coin, uh, it's not a perfect example for empirical probability because, again, uh, we have some intuitive understanding of what might happen as a result of throwing a coin. Here's a better example for empirical probability. Sometimes we, we can use the understanding of empirical probability to calculate probabilities for particular events that had actually happened in the past. Uh, for example, if you're looking at an NBA player, Stephen Curry, who made, let's say, in the past season, uh, 363 out of 400 free throw attempts uh, during that NBA season, and you want to calculate the probability of him making the next free throw attempt, uh, based on empirical probability, you have 363, a number of actual favorable outcomes, and the total number of observations, total number of tries that Stephen had is 400. That ratio actually gives you the probability based on history, so that's empirical probability of him making the next free throw attempt, 0.908 or 9.8%. And talking about probabilities, lastly for our descriptive part of probabilities, before we move on into more interesting math about the probabilities is another type of probabilities which is subjective probabilities. And subjective probabilities is just generally kind of a bit of a guess, that's why it's subjective, it's not objective. It's kind of a guess that assigns uh, whatever probability you think an event has based on whatever information is available, perhaps there is not much information available at all, so uh, you would use subjective probabilities uh, when there is uh, either very little or no experience, no data, no information about such events happening in the past. So it's actually difficult, it's impossible to calculate true objective probabilities, 
So you assign whatever you feel is likely to happen. Uh, for example, if I ask you, well, what are the chances that New England Patriots uh, will play in Super Bowl next year? And uh, there is no information to work with. Uh, then here's perhaps where you could use a bit of a guessing, a bit of a subjective probabilities. So to summarize, uh, there are two kinds of probabilities, objective and subjective. Probabilities are split into two kinds, objective and subjective. And in turn, objective probabilities are either classical, which are based on our intuition, on our understanding of how the world works. And objective probabilities can also be empirical, that's based on actual historical data.